Hello, everyone, and welcome to philoseminar.org. In this series of three talks, we're hearing three ways that people are inferring trees from non-traditional data. First, we heard from Alex bouchard cote on phylogenetics for single cell analysis of cancer. Today, we are going to hear from Miriam Schiffman on inference of cellular differentiation trajectories from single cell RNA-seq. In two weeks, we'll hear from Aaron McKenna about inference of organismal differentiation from CRISPR arrays. If you want to ask a question, you can either tweet at philoseminar or type your question in the live chat box to the right of the video on YouTube. As I mentioned, today's speaker is Miriam Schiffman. Miriam is a graduate student in computational and systems biology at MIT during her PhD with Mara Broderick and Aviv Raghav. Welcome, Miriam, and thanks for participating. Thank you very much, Eric, for the introduction and the invitation to speak. So I'm here to tell you about work we're doing to use probabilistic methods to understand how cells differentiate. And in particular, I'll describe a new framework that we're developing for learning a spectrum of continuous trajectories over latent probabilistic tree and share some of our initial experiments with this work. Um, and this is a joint project with Tamar Broderick at MIT and Aviv Regev across the street at the Broad, as well as lab members from both groups. So more concretely, cellular differentiation describes how stem cells give rise to other types of cells and often an entire suite of cell fates. And this is the process that generated all of the cells in our bodies and continues to replenish many of our cells now. So to give a sense of its ubiquity, the gut epithelium, the cells that make up the lining of your gut, are entirely replenished by newly differentiated cells on the order of weeks. And if you think about wound healing, every time you injure your skin, you can actually observe differentiation as your tissues regenerate over time. So clearly this process happens in some highly reproducible and highly regulated way that we don't fully understand. So one way of thinking about this process is that there's some underlying landscape of differentiation potential. Uh, so this is a drawing made by Waddington in the 50s where he depicted development as a marble rolling down this landscape. Uh, and the marble progressively loses potential as it becomes increasingly committed to particular trajectories and then ultimately ends up in one of those furrows at the bottom of the hill, with, which represent different cell fates. Uh, so you can see there's a lot of different ways to traverse this landscape, but if we trace out the most well-worn paths or the most likely trajectories, we can see it looks something like a tree. And so here's a more familiar way of drawing that same tree on the right, although the one on the left has four leaves, the one on the right has more, but a similar idea. Um, and so in the tree on the right, you can see that at, from a pool of multipotent stem cells at the root, um, this then progresses to various cell fates at the leaves. And so when one of these stem cells divides, it regenerates itself and another progenitor cell that goes on to seed a lineage of increasingly committed cells. And so here the y-axis on this tree, like the height axis on Waddington's landscape, describes decreasing potency and increasing commitment as differentiating cells become incrementally committed to particular cell fates. Sorry, and in fact, uh, yeah. I, 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 here I am immediately interrupt, interrupting, but I'm just curious, I mean, is it, do we really think that each cell is sort of an independent draw from, you know, it's making these sort of probabilistic decisions at every branch point? Or, I mean, is there some sort of predetermination that's already encoded in what each of the cells looks like at the very beginning at the top? Yeah, so that's a really important question. I think when things are at the top, they're more similar because there is a pool of stem cells that are largely the same. Although one difference is that literally things in the environment, so there are um, some niches where like as stem cells move, um, get pushed sort of along an axis, they're surrounded by different environmental factors. And this can affect um, the way that genes are regulated. But in general, the pool at the top starts out as mostly similar. Um, and it is a question as things do progress further down the tree, whether they uh, but, you know, before a cell gets to a branch point, is it already sort of predestined to be more likely to go one way or another way? Um, and that's something that people think does happen to some extent, but are still investigating. Cool. Yeah, so um, again, like and like you said, like we're just drawing one instantiation of the tree, but we can see from this landscape that there's not just one path, but there's this whole distribution over paths or trees, which, like you mentioned, could be influenced by um, things like other cells in the environment. And so Waddington also imagined that underlying this landscape of differentiation are networks of genes whose expression is regulated by uh, transcriptional programs. Um, so this picture recapitulates, again, what we know, which is that differentiation is reproducible. The marbles start in roughly the same place at the top of the hill, and they end up in similar wells at the bottom of the hill in whatever amounts are necessary. Um, and that this process is tightly regulated by networks of co-regulated genes that shape this probabilistic landscape. 
And so clearly in order to understand differentiation, we need to examine the underlying patterns of gene expression or the molecular programs that orchestrate differentiation. Um, and we also would like to better understand the shape of the tree itself. So here, for example, in the idealized picture of differentiation on the right, there are 11 leaves on the tree. Um, and this is a hematopoietic tree, which is a relatively well characterized system, but often for systems that are less well studied, we don't actually know how many leaves or sulfates there should be. Um, so again, because this landscape of differentiation is inherently epigenetic and tied to gene expression, we can learn a lot about it by using single cell sequencing to examine the patterns of gene expression across many individual cells undergoing differentiation. And then the challenge and the motivating challenge of this work is to somehow combine these static snapshots of individual cells to reconstruct the latent branching dynamics or tree of differentiation. And so here are our signposts for the next um, roughly 45 minutes. So to start, we'll take a step back and think about this work in the context of phylogenetics and how it can be viewed as a non-traditional extension of traditional phylogeny to relations between cells, um, which is important to think about what ideas we can borrow from the phylogenetics community, which has been thinking about reconstructing trees for a long time, and then also particular differences that we should be aware of and address. So at a high level, traditional and cellular phylogenetics both aim to take a group of related entities, either organisms or cells, and represent these entities as a tree that describes their relationships. Uh, so optimally, it would be great if we could just follow individual cells or organisms and watch them evolve or differentiate. Uh, and in rare cases, this is possible with things like single cell tracing, which is a talk um, in a couple of weeks, or um, something like Rich Lensky's E. coli experiment, which is on an over 70,000th generation. But these are kind of special cases and not the rule. Um, and so a unifying challenge of both fields is that we generally can't follow a single cell along its differentiation trajectory because this assay is destructive, just like we can't follow organisms throughout evolution. And so instead, we try to infer this tree from what we can observe. And so in particular, phylogenetics on the top here takes an alignment matrix of organisms by their sequences, which might be genes or proteins, and tries to th synthesize this matrix into a tree that explains the ancestry between organisms, whereas cellular phylogenetics at the bottom takes in a gene expression matrix of cells by the genes in their genome and tries to synthesize this matrix into a tree that explains the relationships between cells. And so there are multiple axes where these two types of phylogenetics overlap or are different. Um, so here are some salient ones that came to mind. Um, so in each, the unit of heritability is fundamentally distinct. In traditional phylogenetics, um, we're dealing with uh, organisms that are descended from a common ancestor, but now have different genes or genomes. And so here, the right measurement is uh, genetic comparison, because this is the unit of inheritance and the unit of mutation. Um, whereas in cellular phylogenetics, we're dealing with um, cells that are descended from a common population of stem cells. And so they mostly have identical genomes, with some exceptions like the immune system or cancer. Um, so here the right measurement is gene expression, both because it's inherited via epigenetics like chromatin accessibility or transcription factors, um, and also that this is what distinguishes the behavior and morphology of cells. And then the unit of change is distinct. So traditional phylogenetics, it's somewhat discrete. So either something like ACTG per base um, in a gene, and there's also a discrete nature of a variant. So the species definition provides this clear definition. Whereas in cellular phylogenetics, the changes are inherently continuous because we're talking about transcript levels per gene per cell. Um, and there's also this uh, less of a clear delineation between variants. So this term cell type is often thrown around, but this is sort of a hard classification imposed on soft variations between cells. Um, but in both, it's difficult to model correlated changes across units, like selection that acts at multiple amino acid residues or co-regulated genes, even though we know biologically that this happens, and it's very important, actually. Um, then in terms of noise models, traditional phylogenetics is concerned with things like back mutation and sequencing errors or alignment errors, uh, whereas cellular phylogenetics is mostly concerned with dropout, um, which is the fact that we observe many zeros, and there's a conflation between biological zeros and technical zeros. Um, and in fact, the measurements are so noisy and sparse that we have to examine orders of magnitude more samples than uh, we would for traditional phylogenetics. And in both fields, there are expensive ways to double check with longer reads or higher depth sequencing, but this is hard to do in a high throughput way. Um, the concept of time, in both fields, the tree does have a time axis, but in traditional phylogenetics, we have this idea of a molecular clock, which is the idea that neutral mutations map to clock time. Um, and this is because evolution acts on diversity that's generated roughly by random mutations at some base rate of mutation. 
Whereas in cellular phylogenetics, we really don't have this clock. Um, so we're measuring changes in this high dimensional gene expression space that's governed by some lower dimensional subspace and molecular programs. So this gene regulation is very precise, but it's variably timed. So expression can change slowly or rapidly with respect to clock time. Um, so in cellular phylogenetics, the time axis on the tree really represents the level of potency or of commitment, and it's not necessarily proportional to clock time. Sometimes it's not even monotonic with clock time. And finally, in both fields, there's this interplay between technology and models and insight. So for example, both fields have historically relied on things like morphology of animals or cells or previously annotated markers. Um, and both have really been revolutionized by the advent of new technologies, uh, which namely is the ability to collect these matrices on the left in the first place. And so specifically, um, single cell sequencing offers a new opportunity to understand the imprint of time or dynamic biological processes on individual cells. Um, and this technological advance can be explained with a visual metaphor. So these are four plots that are known as Anscombe's Quartet. Um, and he made them in the 70s to show the importance of plotting your data. So really the takeaway here is that uh, the plots look very different and they have very different trends, but actually, looking at the summary statistics and linear regression, et cetera, for all four data sets is identical. Um, so as an analogy for sequencing technologies, uh, bulk RNA sequencing, where we pool a bunch of cells together, is like only seeing the summary statistics. And this is the regime that we've been limited to for most of modern biology. And this is a totally valid way to study biology if the summary statistics are what you care about. But if we're interested in biology at the resolution of individual cells, like the imprint of time-varying processes or other types of real biological heterogeneity, then single cell methods like single cell RNA sequencing offer a real paradigm shift in how we can study dynamic biological processes like differentiation. Um, and so given this context, we'll look at the motivation from the biology side for what we would want out of a model for cellular differentiation and then what existing methods lack. Um, and it's important to know that there are a lot of people interested in this problem and a lot of um, great existing approaches. So I think it's really important to actually show that we can capture some properties that would be desirable as a biologist and that aren't currently captured by previous methods. Um, so to recap, the motivating challenge here is that we can use SCRNA-seq to profile many individual differentiating cells, and we want to combine all these static snapshots to resolve the underlying tree of differentiation. So we have in hand this matrix of cells by genes filled with sparse transcript counts, such that each row represents a single cell's expression profile across the genes in its genome. And recall that this is a really useful measure of cell state because the cells in your body generally have the same genome sequence, but they look different and do very different things because of differences in how they regulate gene expression. And then because differentiation unfolds asynchronously, the cells that we measure represent a mixture of differentiation states from all over the tree. And so the data has a lot of information and structure, but it's a really challenging problem to go from this matrix of cells sampled non-uniformly over the, an unknown tree to the tree itself. So if we were to cluster the matrix into cell types and connect the dots, we might get something like this uh, canonical tree of hematopoiesis on the right um, that gives rise to the blood immune system. And this is like a tree that you would find if you pull up Wikipedia, uh, with stem cells at the top, different cell fates at the bottom, and discrete intermediates in between. But we know from the biology that differentiation is a continuous process where cells continually become increasingly committed to certain cell fates. And so by doing this, we throw away a lot of the interesting structure that single cell methods now give us access to. So instead, we want a model that allows for continuous trajectories over the tree of differentiation. And also the data is inherently noisy and this biology is complicated. So it seems especially important to account for uncertainty in a coherent way. And working with probabilistic trees gives us, us a framework for thinking about uncertainty over things like where branches happen, where cells fall on the tree, or even how many leaves the tree should have. Um, and again, it's worth mentioning that there's many existing methods for tackling this problem, but most don't have both of these properties of being continuous and probabilistic, in addition to some other properties that we would want. So for example, whereas many existing methods assume the size of the tree a priori, we would like to learn the size of the tree from the data and without requiring a priori knowledge of the number of cell fates. Um, and many existing methods pre-process this count matrix. And because they often have no underlying framework for uncertainty, these pre-processing decisions, like how to normalize or how to do dimensionality reduction, are usually ad hoc rather than reflecting an explicit model of data collection. And so instead, what we'd like to do is holistically model these counts of mRNA transcripts. 
And finally, for many existing methods, adding newly collected data is non-trivial and often requires recomputing from scratch. Whereas optimally, we'd like to take advantage of the modularity of a generative model and to do things like incorporate streaming data, which is where we don't just receive a big sequencing file all at once and be done, but we might expect to continually receive incoming data as more cells are sequenced and potentially even coming from different labs or experiments. Um, we'd like to be able to incorporate heterogeneous samples that are enriched for different kinds of cells, like maybe enriched for stem cells or enriched for certain types of mature cells. Um, we'd like to have the opportunity to incorporate alternative or additional modes of observation, um, something like chromatin accessibility or SNP data. Uh, we'd like to be able to use time information as available. So existing methods are generally designed either for time course experiments or for a single sample of asynchronous cells. And optimally, we'd like to be able to flexibly incorporate either mode of data collection. Um, and in particular, we'd like to do this without assuming that cells are spread evenly over branches at a given time, which can be a failure mode of some of the existing methods. So now we know some of the properties we'd like to capture from the biological side and where um, existing methods fall short. Uh, and the question is whether there's already an existing approach from the machine learning community that just hasn't been applied in the context of biology yet. That's what we'll look at now. Um, there are many existing models for probabilistic trees, but the existing models make limiting assumptions that don't apply here. So some models, like the Dirichlet diffusion tree, model data only at the leaves. Um, this is also true of the Kangman's coalescent, which might be more familiar in the phylogenetics community. Um, and this model can actually be seen as the dual of the DDT in some ways. So this is tailored for something like phylogenetics, um, like if we observe gene sequences of animal species that are alive today and try to reconstruct their latent ancestry. Um, so the DDT model describes a prior over node times on the y-axis based on a probabilistic divergence function that defines a hazard process and over latent states on the x-axis, which here are depicted as one dimensional, so it's easy to draw, where these latent states are given by Brownian motion such that each branch point marks the birth of two independent Brownian motion processes. And the DDT model works by fixing each data point to a leaf and learning the posterior over internal arrangements of the tree. So here, if we think of the lines as potential trajectories and the blue dots as cells, this clearly doesn't capture what we want for this application, which is to model a spectrum of differentiating cells. And there are also hierarchical clustering models like the tree structured stick breaking process or the nested Chinese restaurant process where data lives at the leaves and at internal nodes of the tree. But again, this doesn't capture the continuous trajectories that make sense for the phenomenon that we're interested in here. And so instead, what we want is a way to place cells continuously over the tree. So we've seen that existing approaches in machine learning cannot accommodate the biologically motivated properties that we want. And now we'll go about, we'll talk about how we can go about developing such a model. Um, but first, it's worth pausing to consider what is a model and why do we want one? So by model, what we mean is a generative model, a thing that simulates data. And this might sound useless, we already have data, but it turns out that if we have data and we have a model, then Bayes' rule will let us turn it around and do inference, which we'll get to later. So let's return to the problem. We want a way to place cells continuously over the tree. And our solution is a new model that augments the existing Dirichlet diffusion tree with the notion of a continuous zero one distribution over time from root to leaves. And this distribution encodes our knowledge about the cells in our sample if they're skewed towards mature cells or towards less differentiated cells. So here in the picture on the right, the gray density represents something like a beta distribution that shows that our sample is skewed towards mature cells, which is what we expect for blood cells, for example. And remember again that the time here is really differentiation time, which some people call pseudo time, and that this is distinct from clock time or real world time. Well, okay, this is getting really fast. <laughs> Let's see, so yeah. I, I've read called Trapnel's paper, and I understand that pseudo time is not time, but can you yeah. explain, so what, what is time here? So, so you can imagine if time goes from zero at the root to one at the leaves, what it represents is sort of how, how potent or how committed cells are. So the further they are, the closer they are to zero, the more sort of um, potential there is for them to become many types of cells. And as cells near the bottom of the tree, they really, um, at least in how we've depicted here, it's we cells only go in one direction. In biology, there's actually some special cases where cells can go back in time, but we won't consider it here. So just consider as cells progress forward in time, it means that they're more committed to particular cell fates. They're kind of they've kind of limited themselves from becoming everything, from being omnipotent. And that's and that's formalized straight up in part. And that's 
part of the model. It's just that there's some function that says as t goes to one, then the probability of being able to change your state decreases. Yeah, and that's like in the model, the way that this is given is that the, the space where everything is is given by Brownian motion. And so it's based on the, the previous branch point is sort of the, the mean of a new Brownian motion process that's now going in two independent directions at a branch point. And so um, as we go forward in time, we expect the leaves to sort of get more spread out. So you can also think of the leaves as the closer you are to one, the more distinct you are from um, wherever the stem cells at the root are. Um, so another way to think about it is that things that are more similar to stem cells have a time closer to zero, and things that are uh, more different have a time closer to one. Sure. Okay. And and so can you say the thing about the beta distribution again? And to be clear, this is not this is not like a per branch or something beta. This is like a global beta for the whole tree. Exactly. And that's a really um, good point because so this gray density, so it's a it it can be any distribution that goes from zero to one because this um, notion of differentiation time goes from zero to one, and then the place where you see a higher density is um, what you know when you're collecting a sample of cells, um, which is that certain systems, um, often you tend to see uh, more mature cells than stem cells, and so that's what you would encode here. And again, this is, we'll get to this later, but I mean, this is a prior, it can um, be different in what you learn from the model, but this is where you say, like, I'm a biologist, I know something about the cells that I'm collecting in my sample, um, and so I'll encode that here. If you really don't know anything, you could just make a uniform distribution from zero to one. But if you do know something, it does like help the model to learn if you can encode that here. So, so just for intuition's sake, uh, so if this distribution is skewed towards zero, then it's that means that a lot of the early cells that you collected were actually mature. So if it's skewed towards uh, zero, then you think that a lot of the cells that you've collected are less differentiated cells. Oh, oh, I see. So it's the quantity. It's like the overall quantity. Okay. So that yeah, exactly. y-axis is still this differentiation state, and it's sort exactly. of just density for how okay how many cells are in what bin, basically, in the in the y-axis. Exactly. But it is important, and we'll explore this later. That it doesn't mean that like the place where everything is dense means that there's a dense population on every branch. Um, because this is not true biologically. Certain branches are more popular than others, or certain um, branches take a longer time, sort of, to, to pass through the stage of differentiation, so you collect more cells from the branch. So it's important, and we have to prove this, um, that that by, by doing this, we're not just saying, okay, this is a dense uh, time region over here, and so all of the cells are gonna be spread very densely across every branch at that time. It's important that we avoid that. Mm. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Um, and so we also add a prior over the tree complexity, which lets us learn the number of leaves or cell fates from the data. And if we want, we can root the tree for identifiability reasons based on a typical value for profiles of stem cells. And so now cells first sample a time from this time distribution, and then they diffuse continuously over the tree until their sampled time point, choosing branches according to a rich get richer scheme. And all this means is that the likelihood that a cell chooses a particular child branch is proportional to the number of cells that have previously chosen that branch. And then given a cell spot on a branch, it samples its latent cell state vector, which we call lambda, according to the same Brownian motion process that generates the nodes on the tree. And sorry, you said that's a two-dimensional. Um, so here we're actually drawing one-dimensional latent state right, because right, the right. y-axis is time. But again, this is just because it's a lot easier to draw than some like thousand-dimensional latent state or something. <laughs> uh, and so then we can relate this latent state lambda to the transcript counts that we actually observe through the observation model. So here NUMI is the number of unique transcript barcodes or UMIs. And this is the hypothetical limit on the number of transcripts we could possibly count per gene. And then the binomial probability is a function of that latent cell state, as well as a parameter for experimental noise like gene dropout, which we can also model and learn. And we use a link function, um, h here, that lets us model values on the tree as unconstrained reals, because this is a lot easier than trying to model Gaussian diffusion over positive vectors. So then we just convert these unconstrained values to positive rate parameters for a Poisson model of gene expression. And hypothetically, we could choose any monotonic ponic li positive link function here. But in practice, we choose one that lets us use a variable augmentation trick for efficient inference. Um, and this is the, the logistic sigmoid. So here I've plotted this curve from lambda on the x-axis to a well-defined probability on the y-axis. And so uh, visually, you can see here how this function squashes those unconstrained values on the tree to 0, 1 probabilities. 
Um, so this was a lot that I've thrown at you. So now to um, just do an, a, a big recap of everything that we've talked about so far. And so here, just note that I'm now tilting the axis. So previously time was on the y-axis. Now latent state is gonna be on the y-axis and we're looking at time on the x-axis from zero at the left to one at the right. So this will be more clear once I put something here. Um, so here, this is uh, the beginning of simulating a Dirichlet diffusion tree. And so specifically the topology of the tree is generated by simulating particles. So here we've simulated a particle that goes from zero to one and moves by Brownian motion. And then each particle follows the path of previous particles until it probabilistically diverges at some point and forms a new leaf. And then we keep doing this. And now we've simulated four particles. So here four could be drawn from some distribution over the number of leaves. And then now that we've generated the tree, notice I've grayed out the lines. And this is because all we have to retain from this process are the locations of the tree nodes. So even though I've drawn a particular path from one node to the other, there's actually a distribution over possible paths. And this is called a Brownian bridge. So every squiggly line is just one instantiation of a possible path between points. So I, I, I understand the, the Brownian part. Can you say a little bit about the Dirichlet part? Yeah, so the Dirichlet name is a little bit confusing. The way that Radford Neal um, thought about this process was he wanted to extend the idea of a Dirichlet mixture model um, to, so a Dirichlet mixture model is like you have some number of components, you want to learn the number of components. Um, yeah. And he said, well, what if, like, as is generally true in many applications, what if these components aren't independent, but they have some relationship with each other? And so he came up with this model so that um, in his mind, every leaf on the tree would be would um, represent the parameter of a different cluster. And so those parameters of the different clusters would be related to each other. But there's no actual Dirichlet distribution here. Okay. So it is a little bit of a confusing name. But but how do we know when to make a new branch point? Yeah, so the idea is that there's a, you could choose a divergence function, which has one parameter that is the concentration. And so you can set this parameter um, and that causes things to either tend to branch earlier or tend to branch later. But basically a particle continues to um, follow paths and again, and chooses based on this rich get richer um, idea if it gets to a branch point. And then as it travels along a branch, there's a, this um, hazard function which is basically means everything has to branch by time one, but there's some likelihood that it'll branch on any particular segment. And so it just evaluates whether it should branch. If it does it branch, then it starts its own independent Brownian motion process and starts a new path. And otherwise it just keeps traveling. Um, but it has to branch at some point before time one. Yeah, it might help um, if we to look um, actually in the, paper that we have on archive, we go into more detail about the divergence function that function that we choose. Um, and uh, yeah, the cumulative divergence function, which is sort of what governs um, whether something will branch or not. Thanks. Yeah, good question. Um, so okay, now we've got the tree. So that was all the part that comes directly from the Dirichlet diffusion tree. Um, and now we fix this initial topology, and then we'll draw cells from this density over the tree. Um, and so imagine here that we've drawn a time from the tree, uh, sorry, from the density on the bottom, and then the cell has diffused down the tree and chosen a spot on the branch. Um, and then as we draw more and more cells, uh, notice that the distribution of the, the path changes. And this is because again, even though we've drawn gray lines here, there's in fact a probability distribution over paths. Um, and so cells pick a location and this changes the structure of the tree. And so now we've got 100 cells on the tree. Um, and so one important thing to notice is that uh, the more sparsely sampled portions of the tree, um, like over here, uh, even though we've drawn one path, that would have a much higher variance and therefore more uncertainty, since you would imagine that um, this, these paths between these two faraway points could potentially change more drastically than some like more densely sampled portion of the tree over here where you can, there's not like really much room for this path to diverge much between these points. And so what this means is that better sampled portions of the tree will have relatively well-defined paths um, and therefore lower vari variance, meaning that we're more certain about uh, where that part of the tree belongs. And then we can keep adding cells. And so for example, if we had 1500 cells, here's one example instantiation of the tree. 
And then we relate this tree um, to what we actually observe through the observation model. So remember uh, these lambdas on the y-axis are real numbers, they're positive or negative. Um, so we squash them to well-defined probabilities with the logistic sigmoid. And then we sample this matrix X of gene expression counts from the binomial that's parameterized by this positive transformation of those lambdas on the tree. Um, and you can imagine this is just one mode of observation. But um, maybe if you, if you had some different type of data, you could hook up different observation models to so the same underlying latent tree model. Um, if you had something like uh, attack seek measurements or potentially even in combination with um, linear tracing barcodes or something like that. So if I understand correctly, there's one dimension in the latent space for every gene? There is, yeah. So in practice, the, what we um, do is look at the genes and see which are the most um, differentially expressed across the cells in the sample. So basically, which ones have the most information um, to distinguish between cells. Um, but definitely, um, it, yeah, the problem does scale with the number of genes that we choose to look at. Um, the good thing about that, I, I mean, it's, it's the scaling is the bad thing. The good thing is that it makes the model more interpretable because we can look at each dimension in latent space and relate it directly back to what gene that corresponds to. So that part is nice. So the model that we've described has the properties that we want, which is that cells arise from a latent continuum of branching cell states, rather than imposing discrete cell types on an inherently continuous process. Um, the full generative model now gives us a coherent framework for uncertainty. And this can point to things like where we're least confident and where we should collect new data, instead of returning a single tree and a set of cell labels. And we also get this modular separation of components like the latent tree model versus the observation model. And this modularity extends to things like the flexibility to incorporate metadata, like time information, as available, but not require it. Um, so for example, we can specify the model with time points, which is what I'm showing here immediately to the right of the tree. Um, or basically, each sampled time point in real time now indexes a different time distribution over the tree. Um, and this time distribution, this set of time distributions now monotonically shifts its expectation according to clock time. So here we interpolate from a density that's skewed towards the undifferentiated cells to skewed towards differentiated cells as we collect later and later time points. Um, or we can specify the model with a single asynchronous sample associated with a single prior over cell times, um, which is, um, as we mentioned before, related to what types of cells we expect to collect. Uh, or this double-headed arrow is meant to indicate that we can do anything in between. So we could have a mix of time point samples and asynchronous samples, or we could incorporate heterogeneous samples that are experimentally enriched for different types of cells and directly encode this in the time distribution. Um, and again, uh, remember what I said is that um, it's in, naively we might expect that specifying different time concentrations could lead the model to spread cells evenly across branches at those particular times, and that this um, is an observed pathology of some methods. Uh, so it's important to show that we can modulate the time distribution while modulating the concentration of cells per branch. And so to do this, we're going to look at some simulated trees from the same model. Um, and so here what I've done is frozen the same tree and the same prior over cell times, and then done three different draws of cells. Um, and those three different draws are represented in each row. Uh, and remember what we're looking for is, is if we can avoid the behavior that we don't want, which is that we say there's a concentration of cells over time, and the model responds by bunching those cells up uniformly over all the branches at that time. Um, so to orient you here, every row is a different sample of cells drawn from the same model. The colored dots are cells, the lines are branches, uh, and each column is just a different projection of the same tree in principal component space. So on the left, we have time on the y-axis, um, and cells are colored by their time point label. I've done five time points here. Um, and on the right, the, the tree is now projected onto the first two principal components and colored by branch. And so indeed, what we see here is that in three different draws from the same prior, different branches can become much more, much less heavily populated, populated by cells. So the takeaway here is that this is a rich model class that lets us model what we want biologically, um, which is not that cells uh, necessarily uniformly populate the tree, but they can be sporadic or dense on different branches. And biologically, this relates to the speed at which cells undergo each transition, as well as the popularity of each path. So this gives us a toolkit for generating data from our model. But we have the data and want to learn the parameters of the model. And this is called doing inference. And this one-liner, which is Bayes' rule, gives us the route from model to inference. And so we'll unpack everything on this slide in more detail, but we'll start by defining the variables, uh, which is x and big theta. 
So theta is the set of all of the parameters that we want to learn. So in the context of this problem, we want the tree structure and topology, as well as the location of each cell or blue dot on the tree. And, and here, the location is defined by the latent state, a time, and a branch assignment. And then x is the data, uh, and it's what we have, which is a matrix of transcript counts or cell profiles. And so looking at the equation from right to left, P of theta is the prior over the unknowns, and this is what we know about before we've seen the data. So this is where we can encode our knowledge of biology, like if we know our sample is enriched for a certain type of cells, or if we suspect approximately how many leaves the tree should have. And then if we've collected data, we want to say how the data relates to the unknowns. This is the model or the likelihood, which is P of x given theta. And this tethers this latent generative process that we've invented to what we would actually observe. But again, we don't just want to simulate data, we want to learn from data. And Bayes' theorem does exactly that. We have x given theta, and we turn it into theta given x. So this posterior density, P of theta given x, captures what we've learned after seeing data. And Bayes' theorem forms this posterior density up to a normalizing constant. That's why we see the proportional sign here. Um, and it would be great if we could just use Bayes' rule empirically. Uh, but in practice, we can't numerically calculate the posterior for even minimally complex problems. And this is a lot more than minimally complex. And so instead, we use some mechanism for approximation. And often, this takes the form of Markov chain Monte Carlo. Um, and so to parse this, so the Monte Carlo part means that we can take random numbers and do some kind of deterministic computations on them to approximate a function, which could be like generating draws from a probability density that we're interested in. And then the Markov chain part means that we draw these random samples, uh, or in this case, randomly sampled trees from a Markov chain. And we construct the Markov chain such that its target distribution or stationary distribution is exactly the posterior density that we want, uh, P of theta given x, up to a normalizing constant. And so in other words, MCMC lets us explore this theta space of possible trees and draw samples from the space proportional to their density under the posterior. And it turns out that this procedure is exact in the limit if we run it for infinite steps. But because my PhD only gives me finite time and finite compute, the procedure returns a set of samples that form an approximation of the posterior. And we develop an algorithm for inference that combines an MCMC sampler with message passing steps. Um, and so I'm just going to give a high level description of the algorithm, but just know that inference is actually the biggest challenge and where we spend the most time. Um, and unfortunately, this problem is too complex for probabilistic programming languages, like you heard about last week, at least as they exist today. So we have to do this ourselves. Um, so here, the top moves in the diagram propose changes to tree and cell topology. So the, you see the internal structure of the tree changing on the left and the number of leaves on the tree on the right. And the bottom moves change the locations of cells and nodes. So on the left, message passing can efficiently resample all of the latent states conditioned on times. And again, it, uh, we can do this because we take advantage of this variable augmentation trick that I mentioned. And then cell resampling samples new cell locations by letting cells sample a new time, choosing a branch at that time slice, which becomes a Gaussian mixture model since we have Brownian motion. Uh, and then we sample a new latent state on that branch. And again, the reason that this algorithm works is that the crux of Bayesian inference, which is that given a full generative model and some data, we can invert the model to learn its parameters. So we have our model, we have inference, and we need a way to kick the tires and test how well it all works. Um, in particular, we want to test whether we can recover ground truth. But in order to test this, we have to know what ground truth is. And this is generally unavailable for real sequencing data. And so instead, we consider a case where we do know, which is simulated data that has parameters that we know and we can compare against. So we simulate data from the model. And then we try to relearn the latent structure. And specifically, we simulate a tree. We simulate cells on that tree. And then for each cell or blue dot on the tree, we use its latent state lambda to simulate its observed expression profile x. And we do this for 2,000 cells with 10 genes per cell to get that matrix of transcript counts that we described at the beginning. And this is analogous to a, a smaller, simplified version of what we could measure in a single cell sequencing experiment. So here in the upper left, I'm visualizing this matrix of data by projecting it onto its first two principal components. And now from these observations, we want to reconstruct the original tree in latent space. And as preliminary work, we treat this as a simulated time course experiment, which is a simpler problem where we know the true times and node topology. So first, we consider a very basic baseline of what it looks like to reconstruct the tree poorly. Um, so what we do is use the same generative process to randomly sample a new tree with identical parameters, and then generate cells randomly along that tree. 
And then we look at how well the latent cell states resemble the latent states from the original tree. Um, so specifically, each line here is actually an arrow that points from the sampled value to the true value per cell, uh, where the true value is the latent state that we use to simulate each observation. And so the longer the arrow is, the further away we are from ground truth. And again, we're considering latent cell state, which actually lives in 10 dimensions, but here we're projecting onto the first two principal components for visualization purposes. And we see that while this is just one particular arrow, all of the latent cell parameters are very far from their true values. Um, but the real question is, what do we see when we actually run inference? And so first we see that our initialization procedure alone actually gets us most of the way there. So this is the tree that we use to initialize the sampler plotted in the same principal component space. And the arrows shrink, meaning that the delta between the true and inferred cell locations becomes small. And we get this in large part from that variable augmentation trick that I mentioned that has nice conjugacy properties. So this initialization procedure that we invent uses a part of the full inference algorithm to find a good starting tree. And again, this is just a starting point, but it's actually important for inference because MCMC converges in the limit. But given that we have finite time, it helps a lot to start from a good place in parameter space. Um, so then we actually run the sampler and we get an estimate of the posterior distribution over trees. And to assess how we're doing, we'll look at the maximum a posteriori tree, which is the highest probability tree that we've found so far. Um, and we see that after running the sampler, the map tree we recover is even better. These look like points, but they're actually minuscule arrows, showing that cell locations have converged to ground truth. And so this shows that our techniques can recover those latent cell states from their observed expression profiles. But we're actually really interested in recovering the underlying tree structure, none of which I've shown here. And so now we'll switch to examining the branch assignment per cell, all in latent space. Um, and so again, starting with that tree that we used to initialize the sampler. Uh, on the right, those are the same principal component axes as in the previous slide. Uh, but now the lines on top show how the corresponding nodes on the tree are connected in latent space. And on the left, the plot now has time from 0 to 1 on the y-axis. And cells in both columns are colored according to which branch they've been assigned. And visually what we see is that even though our initialization procedure largely recovers the cell states, it jumbles up the cell branch assignments since all those colors are mixed together. And in contrast, after sampling, cells are assigned to branches on the map tree in a sensical way, where colors are grouped coherently, meaning that cells on the same branch resemble each other in latent space. And this looks almost identical to the ground truth tree. But if you look closely, you can see that the color ordering has switched. And this is reminiscent of the label switching problem in clustering, where running MCMC on any unsupervised model that has labeled components often switches how the same clusters index from sample to sample. So like if you imagine you have a probabilistic clustering model, you're trying to learn a handful of clusters, say 0 to 4, the model might take the same cluster and label it the 0th cluster in one sample, and the third cluster in another sample, and the second cluster in another sample, since the label numbers are actually arbitrary. And so this doesn't detract from recovering the model, but it does mean that we have to be careful in our case when making comparisons between trees. And so we come up with a quantitative way to compare cell relationships across trees that's immune to this label switching problem. And this is a new metric that we call the triplet metric. So briefly, what we do is subsample a triplet of cells. And then if we label these with their triplet indices, we can see that these are the same three cells on each tree. So we're comparing the left tree to the right tree, looking at the same three cells. And then we examine the pairwise distance between each pair, starting with cells one and two. And this is the distance that is required to traverse the tree from one cell to the other, where cells have to travel by the most recent common ancestor node. And here, the distance between cells inf inspired by methods from phylogenetics is measured in branch length in time. And so we'll call this pairwise distance d of one and two. And then we'll do this for every pair in the triplet, traveling by the Merca node, measuring the pair resistance in branch length. And then we'll do the same for the, every pair on the rightmost tree. And then we ask ourselves with this indicator function whether the outlier cell of the three is the same on both trees. And so to answer this indicator function, we identify the pair in each tree with the shortest pairwise distance. And then the outlier cell is the cell that's not in this pair. And so we see that the left and right trees do not agree. And so we set the indicator to 0. And that was a procedure for a single triplet, but we're interested in the relationships between all the cells on the, same, on the tree. Um, and so we take this equation star, and we evaluate it for all sets of triplets. And then we divide by the number of triplets that we're comparing to get an average over triplets on a scale of 0 to 1. 
So zero represents 0% 0 agreement between cell topologies on the left and right tree, and one represents perfect agreement. And in practice, we would actually do this for a random subsample of triplets. Um, and this triplet metric um, that we uh, derive is agnostic to branch labeling and also agnostic to tree size. So notice that the left and right trees have a different number of leaves. Um, and it's also robust to branches being stretched or shrunk across trees. Um, and this is important since differentiation time is a modeling concept. And so the absolute changes in, in branch length can actually be an artifact. And so the triplet metric has the nice property that it acts as a sort of non-parametric test where it's not sensitive to small perturbations in branch length that wouldn't be meaningful biologically. Um, so this metric has the property that we would want in a measure for comparing trees. So to go back to our original problem, we're trying to compare the map to the true tree, but the branch labels have switched. Um, so we compute the triplet metric against the ground truth tree that we use to simulate the data. So zero represents 0% 0 agreement with the true cell topologies and one represents perfect agreement. And we see as a baseline, the random tree from earlier scores 0.4, which is pretty close to 0% agreement. Our initialization procedure improves on the score and the map tree we recover after inference brings our agreement with ground truth topologies to over 0.8 showing equilibration towards the true cell topologies. And finally, we can begin to reap the benefits of our probabilistic approach by examining the branch uncertainty per cell. So here we're again laying cells on top of the map tree, visualized along a projection of latent space versus time. But the map tree is just one sample from inference, whereas inference actually gives us an entire posterior distribution over trees. So here we use this distribution to color cells by their relative variability over branch assignments. And we do this by taking the set of thin samples that we get from inference, each of which is a tree that has an associated set of cell locations. And then we tally across all the samples how much uh, time during inference each cell spends on one branch versus switching branches. And then we measure variability based on a categorical measure of dispersion scaled to 0, 1. And then we color each cell here on a range of 0 at black if it lingers around the same branch to 1 at yellow if it switches around a lot. And what we see is that, as expected, cells are most confident in their assignment near the leaves of the tree, which are the most spread out in latent space. And they're the least confident where they belong in regions of the tree where branches are close together or even overlap. So now we're in the, the home stretch. Uh, in summer, we fill in the missing link among probabilistic tree models for data generated continuously along the branches of a latent tree. And in tandem, we develop an inference algorithm, and we show that our techniques can leverage simulated observations to recover the latent parameters we care about with calibrated uncertainties. This uncertainty framework is lacking in many methods. And as a result, we can build a model that more accurately captures the biology of cellular differentiation by treating it as a process that operates along a continuum of branching cell states. Um, and if you're interested, we have a preprint on archive with more details. Um, and so some of the uh, directions that we're currently working on or hope to work on in the future. Um, first, uh, clearly um, the whole point of this model is to apply it to real data. So either time point uh, data like zebrafish embryos or the harder asynchronous regime. Um, we have data sets from mouse trachea which have relatively simple differentiation topology. Um, and then also as a starting point, human hematopoietic data which is a relatively well studied system. Um, we're also working on new metrics for comparing trees of differing sizes, such that node matching is challenging or impossible. Um, and this ties into another thing, which is how to visualize a distribution over trees. So here I've been showing everything on top of the map tree, but what if the posterior is multimodal? How would we visualize the full distribution? Um, and this relates back to tree metrics because we want to know how to summarize the posterior, which probably is going to require clustering or comparing trees in some way. Um, on the observation model side, we're interested in extensions to new modalities of observation, um, like other measurements and other types of metadata besides SCRNA-seq. And then on the latent variable model side, we're interested in extending a similar latent diffusion model to the cell cycle by modeling it as a circular non-branching trajectory. Um, and we're interested in this question that I mentioned earlier, which is how deterministic or stochastic cell fate decisions are. Uh, and so in particular, the model that I've described is actually a building block towards a more complex iteration of the model, um, where in this more complex version, branch points are planes rather than zero dimensional like they are here. And this allows cells to approach from many different trajectories, which we'll model as switching linear dynamical systems rather than a single path. And we want to use this model to examine whether cells are probabilistically inclined towards particular fates prior to branching. 
And then powerfully, we can actually test and refine predictions by perturbation. So either experimental perturbations like PerturbSeq, where we can knock down or knock out genes that we think are important to certain branch decisions and see if the tree changes as we would expect. And we can also use the model to understand natural perturbations like disease by comparing healthy and disease topologies. And now I just want to thank everyone who's been involved since the beginning. Um, so Will Stevenson is another grad student in the Broderick group. Uh, Jonathan is now a postdoc at Harvard. Trevor was here and is now a new faculty at UBC. And of course, Tamara. And then Aviv Regev and her postdoc, Jeff Schiebinger. So thank you. And this is very much work in progress. So please feel free to reach out if anything I've mentioned sparks interest or you have ideas about some uh, angle where this might be useful. So thank you. Thank you. That was quite remarkable. Uh, <laughs> that's like, I, I just love that you took it everywhere from, you know, formulation through the, uh, the model, through your inference and so on. So we'll definitely take some questions. I certainly have some more. Uh, cool. So if you do have some questions, paste them in chat or tweet. Um, so let's see, where to start? Um, so the, I mean, regarding dimensionality, I mean, so you did talk about how the nice thing about having one latent dimension per uh, gene means that you can easily interpret the uh, what the latent variables mean. But I mean, it seems like even if you did a dimensionality reduction step, you could still sort of go back and see in the original gene space. Yeah, I agree. I think like right now, this is how we're thinking about the model. But um, once we do start running into scaling problems more, I think using some kind of uh, maybe linear dimensionality reduction that will still let us relate what we've learned to gene expression will probably be useful and does actually relate back to what we know, which is that even though gene expression is very high dimensional, there is some lower dimensional space of molecular programs that are regulating gene expression. So it does actually make sense to do this in a lower dimensional space. Yeah, yeah, that's sort of right. I mean, yeah, the ideal thing would be to sort of learn the latent embedding jointly such that you could, maybe it would be especially interpretable so that you're not just mm -hmm. running CA or something, but yeah, that, that sounds hard. Yeah, um, definitely, but something to explore for sure. Speaking of things that seem hard, I'm, <laughs> the calculating proposal densities for your split merge steps, I would guess wouldn't be super easy, but is it? Am I missing something? Um, yeah, so basically you just have to be really careful to make sure that everything is reversible. Um, and so basically we only want to propose a, the type of split step that could be undone with one merge step and vice versa. Um, so it's definitely tricky, but possible. So like I said, if we could do this with um, a probabilistic programming language, that would be awesome. But uh, unfortunately, I don't think what we have right now will cut it. Just looking for that slide, which has more details. Uh, so Jesus Martinez asks about you know, what sort of tree prior you have. I mean, maybe this is a perfect slide to talk about that. Yeah, so the tree prior is exactly what I described in terms of um, the Dirichlet diffusion tree process. Um, so sort of like the prior uh, parameters that we have to think about setting, and these can be made hyperparameters that we can resample. So one is the concentration parameter, which is what controls that probabilistic branching function, basically how early different branches um, branch off. Um, then we have a prior over the number of leaves on the tree. Um, and, and notice that both these things, and that's why this is a good slide, both these things can change. So we start by generating some initial tree, but then that subtree move um, on the top left, for example, even if the initial tree has um, like branches at particular places that don't end up being good for the data that we've collected, that's how the internal uh, nodes of the tree can move around. And the split, split merge move on the right, even though we start with some initial number of leaves on the tree, we can propose changes that make the tree bigger, make the tree smaller. Um, and if that's um, favored based on the observations, then that might be accepted and then we would move to that tree. Um, and then, um, yeah, then we've got the, the density uh, that's the prior over cell times. Um, but then again, cells start at some time on some branch, but they can move around by resampling a new time. Um, and then, uh, Again, the latent states of the nodes and of the cells themselves are governed by Brownian motion. And the most efficient way to actually resample those is with message passing, which um, because we have a binary tree and we use variable augmentation to get Gaussian conjugacy for everything, we can actually just do two rounds of message passing and then resample all the latent states at once, which is very wow. efficient. Yeah. 
Uh, I mean, but you described the prior as being uh, you can independently specify the number of tips, like the prior and the number of tips, and these sort of con like the density, the Dirich. Uh, I'm sort of fumbling over words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the size of the tree, the number of leaves, but then there's that other, the concentration parameter is whether. So everything that is a leaf had to branch off of a previous path at some point, and so that's a parameter that says our our branch is more likely to branch close to the root or to branch close to the leaves. So that's um, a proportionality thing. So you can sort of specify those two things independently. You can, yeah. Um, and then you, you specify them, but again, you can always resample the number of leaves or just some prior over what they might be. And then the concentration parameter, you can actually use slice sampling to resample that as well. Cool. So, um, I mean, I guess you did a really nice job of showing that your map tree is close to the simulated tree. But I mean, have you looked to see if your posterior is sort of fully capturing the uncertainty that you have? Yeah, so that's what I was kind of trying to get at with that um, tree where I was showing uh, uncertainty plotted on top of the map tree. Um, and it it really is a problem that like I don't totally know how to solve. Like how do I how do I even explore on my own? How do I do explore exploratory data analysis on a posterior over trees without looking at every simple single sample from the posterior? So this was one of my attempts to do that, which is OK, I know I've learned um, this tree seems like a pretty good representation of the tree. But like, do cells like stick around where they are in the map tree or in the, all these other trees that I've drawn? Are they moving around? And so this picture, I think, did give us a sense that our, our uncertainties are actually calibrated. But it, it is going to be a really hard problem to see, like, you know, in terms of the size of the tree or the topology of the tree, is that uncertainty well calibrated? And that's something that I'm still thinking about. And I would be like very happy to talk to anyone who has mm -hmm. ideas or previous work to look at. I mean, but I guess, I mean, there's something to be gained. I mean, I, if you believe your implementation, uh, I mean, there's definitely seems like there's something to be gained for running a simple example, like horribly, horribly long, and, and assuming that that's sort of a correct sample from the posterior, and then just seeing, OK, if you run it for some more reasonable amount of time, like, are you getting back you know, posterior summaries that seem like they're concordant with the very long run? Yeah, although like in looking at this um, particular ground truth tree that I've generated, because the branches do kind of uh, are close together, I think maybe a good model would actually tell you you can never be super certain about where the cells in that part of the tree belong because they're so close together. So I mean, in some sense, we don't want to be too confident also, depending on the, the structure of the tree that yeah, we're trying to learn. Yeah, I think we're saying the same thing. I mean, just like it's... Uh, you you want to make sure that the uncertainties are converging to their you know desired distribution. Yeah, exactly. There's no point in having a distribution with uncertainty unless you actually trust those uncertainties. So uh, just the silly question of okay, well, there like this is sort of a competitor to Monocle, right? Mm. So, yeah. So I don't know if we want to be a competitor in terms of like you know we're running MCMC. We're probably never going to be oh, yeah. as faster, faster. I think it's more like what you want out of a model. So if you're interested in things like you might have other types of information you want to be able to incorporate, or you you know that you're collecting a mix of uh, time points and asynchronous samples, and you want something that is going to be um, like easier to combine all these different types of information that you have, then I think this is a model that makes sense. But I don't know if we're like a competitor in that I want to do like benchmarking because I think that we're always going to lose in that in that scenario. Well, no, I mean, I don't mean like <laughs> benchmarking, but I mean, I, I would be curious to know, like, how does Monocle fare on your simulated setup? Like, yeah, that's a really good question. It's not I haven't not gotten to the step yet where I am directly comparing models. But I think one interesting I mean, one problem in this field is that there are a lot of methods and there's not really a ground truth or like a gold standard data set even with an answer. So when you compare to other methods, like there generally isn't a way of saying like this one did better than the other one. Um, so I think some of the like sort of test cases we might set up is that, for example, sometimes when people actually often when people collect cells that they think, you know, I'm collecting hematopoietic cells, you actually get in that mixture some cells that are not involved in that differentiation process, but are in the environment. And so I think one test which we could do with simulated data is that if you have a mix of cells that are from one differentiation system and you've also thrown in um, something that doesn't belong there, like is a model capable of learning that or will that just like totally mess up everything that goes on um, with the tree structure of the model? So I think setting up sort of like test cases for like real pathologies that you might encounter in the wild um, will be one uh, avenue for this. Very cool. Um,
I don't see any other questions, so maybe we can stop um, there. Um, thank you very much, Miriam. Great. Thanks for inviting me.